again even though we uh, in our little unofficial chit chat if i may call that i i did already express my gratitude but i'm again going to to do that we are uh, we're immensely grateful for you to take out your time and be here and uh, and interact or uh, give your useful insights to our uh, faculty and students and even more so because when i found out that you're actually on holiday and so um, and you still you could take up time for uh, us lovely ladies from pakistan if i may uh, may may steal this moment to say so so uh, that that puts me uh, that that uh, that makes me even more uh, grateful so um Um, for the audience i would uh, introduce uh, dr horman uh, dr uh, horman professor dr kai horman uh, who is our today's guest speaker for this webinar is one of the finest professors in the field of computer aided geometric design presently he is a full professor in the university of italian switzerland lugano switzerland uh, he's also served as a dean in the same institute uh his his contributions towards international research as a chair co-chair member steering committee and also in different international uh, he's also served as a dean in, in workshops like uh, society of industrial and applied uh, mathematics same institute uh, eurographics acm uh, are worth mentioning uh and today of course the topic of his webinar as uh, i believe our audience is already aware is generalized barycentric coordinates if i pronounced it correctly uh though um so just going to add this that during my phd i did part of my work on uh, riemannian manifolds and geodesic distances and i was calculating a closed form uh, solution um so that's where i appreciated my and that's where i developed my respect uh, and appreciate and true appreciation for mathematicians so even though it, it's not really uh, uh, let's say related to my main research area or my expertise but i too will be very uh, interesting interested in listening to dr to kai homan so before i actually invite uh, dr homan to uh, start his uh, his talk um i will uh, uh, i will uh, invite dr maria hussain who's chief person of a mathematics department to share uh, her insight and some view her views about and, and give us a bit of a background about her department also i may add here that we have invited our uh, worthy vice chancellor professor dr bushra mirza who is uh, who is basically a, a biologist uh, uh, and uh, she has uh, however uh, with her uh, with very large years of experience uh, in teaching and research she's now our uh, vice chancellor so if we we requested her to also join in uh, briefly and uh, give us her best wishes let's say so whenever whenever she joins because she has a, a rather busy hectic schedule so we will uh, request her to uh, to uh, to say a few words uh, for our webinar so i now invite dr maria uh, hussain who is a uh, chairperson mathematics department to share her views thank you dr xar thank you very much um, i am really indebted uh, that professor herman has uh, accepted our request uh, and it will be a great honor and pleasure to have uh, him um, as a uh, uh, guest speaker of the webinar i would like to introduce department of mathematics of lcwu today and uh, department of mathematics is currently offering bs ms and phd program in, math in mathematics nowadays and we have total 14 faculty members out of which 12 are phd in different fields uh, which are uh, computer aided geometric design Uh, signal processing graph theory and relativity and uh, cosmology and um, uh, numerical solution of partial differential equations as well the focus of the department of mathematics is uh, on quality of teaching as well as research and um, here i would also like to thank uh, and i would take uh, the opportunity to thank to our worthy vice chancellor professor dr bushra mirza for her guidance and support for organizing this webinar and our dean for quality of science and technology professor dr shukufta nas for his support in all this process here's all from my side dr aksa thank you so much uh thank you dr maria thank you immensely so um i will uh, i just want to add another thing i will uh, be present in this webinar for the bulk of the time but in case i have to leave early dr sarzia will uh, will then continue onwards so uh, now i invite uh, dr horman to to please kindly uh, start the webinar and enlighten us with his immense knowledge 
Okay, thank you for all these kind words and thank you also for giving me the opportunity to to share with you my knowledge on a topic uh, that I really love, that I'm passionate about and I'm happy that you're interested in it and that I can talk to you today. It's a great honor to talk to you lovely women and it's uh, my pleasure to, to speak about this topic. Can't share your screen. Oh my goodness. So now I wanted to share the screen. We tested it before. Now it doesn't work. Let's try it again. Now it works. Okay. Good. So, generalist bicentric coordinates, that is the topic of my talk. I hope you can all see my slides. Quick feedback on that. Yes, yes. Wonderful, good. And before I go really into the topic, let me uh, introduce a little bit where I am right now. So I uh, live and work here in Ticino, that's the southern part of Switzerland, the Italian speaking part. It's the fifth largest canton, That's those are the regions of Switzerland, um, with Italian as an official language and about one third million of inhabitants. So compared to Lahore, this is really tiny. And the whole of Switzerland has only about 8 million inhabitants, so we are really small. The major but, cities... If I may interrupt, compared to Lahore, much cooler and very much, and, and also very beautiful. <laughs> it is. Well, it, it actually can get quite hot here in summer. We had about up to 35 degrees. Not as bad as 40 degrees, but up to 35 we can have. And it's getting hotter with the climate change. Anyhow, uh, we have three major cities in Ticino, Lugano, that's where I am, Bellinzona, that's the capital of the canton, and Locarno, well, that's the place where all the Germans and Northern Swiss, Swiss go to, uh, for their holidays because it's on another nice lake. We, we enjoy a very nice Mediterranean climate, not too cold in winter and not too hot in summer. And we uh, have this nice combination of Swiss functionality, everything works, and the Italian flair. So this is Ticino, and I work at the Uni Università della Svizzera Italiana, so the, yes, the University of Italian part of Switzerland, UZI for short, which was founded in 96, so we're also only 25 years old, uh, similar to you. And we have three campuses. The main campus is here in Lugano, and then we have a smaller campus in Mendrisio, where the Faculty of Architecture is, and also in Bellinzona, we have a few uh, uh, buildings and uh, people. And we currently consist of five faculties, Architecture, Biomedical Sciences, Communication, Culture and Society, Economics and Informatics. That's the department where I am uh, working at. Our Faculty of Informatics is even younger. It was founded only in 2004, so we are barely 17 years old. Uh, we are number three in Switzerland after the two big ones at, at Zurich and Lausanne, EPFL and ETH Zurich. And we are a quite international faculty with 31 professors from 12 countries. We excel in research with 11 ERC grants uh, that we got as a faculty since 2010, so one per year. Uh, in case you don't know, ERC grants are great grants from the European communi community um, that are really top notch with several millions of funding. And we uh, also have a focus on our innovative teaching program and we currently educate around 400 students on all levels, bachelor, master and PhD. We offer a Bachelor of Science in Informatics, that's a three-year program, followed up by a two-year Master of Science, which our students can take in several areas, from informatics to financial technology and computing, including also AI and management and software engineering, and computation sciences, which is the more mathematical part of our Master offers. And then if you are good enough and we have a position for you, you can also continue with a doctorate, with a PhD, which can be in all research areas. And we currently focus on these eight research areas. So computational science, geometric and visual, visual computing, that's my uh, main research area, information systems, intelligence systems, programming languages, software engineering, computer systems and theory and algorithms. So we cover quite a good range of informatics topics, including also applied mathematics. For myself, let me just introduce just a few facts about me and my life. So I was born in 1974. You can do the maths that, that I'm about to be 47 this year. And I was born in Lübeck in the north of Germany. You can see the blue dot. It's right on the Baltic Sea, close to the former border to eastern Germany, but in the western part. And then when I became 18 and finished high school, I moved uh, a bit further south 
to Erlangen, uh, which where we have a big university of Erlangen and Nuremberg, and I did my diploma in mathematics and then a PhD in informatics in the next 10 years. Uh, within that time, I had a research visit at Tel Aviv University and another research stay for half a year as a Mingle research fellow that was a big European project at the research institute Sintef in Oslo. And then I did a postdoc at Caltech, first at Caltech, one year in the US in California, and then one year of a postdoc at the CNR, that's a research institution in Pisa. And then I went back to Germany, became an assistant professor at the Technical University of Klausa, right in the center of Germany. And since 2009, I have been a professor here in Lugano with a research stay as a visiting professor in Singapore in 2018. So that is my career uh, in a uh, Professor Homan, if I may interrupt, and probably the last time I'm, I'm doing this. So if we invite you to Pakistan and you honor us by coming here, I believe that will make the map, the map even more interesting of your journey. Absolutely, absolutely. Then I really will have to add Asia to the map. <laughs> yeah. which from, uh, I just solved like this. Yeah, it would be great to, to come visit you one day. Okay, so after this short introduction, let us start now with the technical, with the mathematical, with the academic part of this presentation. And if you, if you have a question, feel free to interrupt me. I'm really happy to take questions also during the presentation. Uh, otherwise, I'm also around after the talk to answer your questions that you may have. So uh, but feel free to also interrupt me. I, I don't take it badly, no, and I'm prepared for that. Uh, for me, it's much more important that you can follow the talk. And so if you have a basic question of understanding, if you are missing something, maybe it's better to just interrupt me, ask me, I'll explain, and then you can enjoy the rest of the talk and follow. So generalized barycentric coordinates, I wanted to first talk, I go from right to left. Let's start with coordinates and remember what are coordinates, because then we can understand what barycentric coordinates are and what generalized barycentric coordinates are. Coordinates, as you all know, are um, a way to understand where something is in a coordinate system. So, for example, when you go to Wikipedia and look up Lahore, uh, where your nice institution is, then in the upper right, you can find the coordinates of your place, expressed with two uh, difficult, seeming, seemingly difficult numbers, uh, which are, of course, as we all know, just the latitude, and the longitude. So they tell you how far measured in degrees we are from the, or you are from the equator towards the North Pole. So it's 31 degrees, so almost one third of the way from equator to North Pole. We are basically halfway. We are on 46 degree latitude here in Lugano. And you are 74 degrees east, east of the prime meridian that runs through Greenwich near London. So you're east of that um, on the map. And these coordinates help you to, to find a place to give to specify a unique place on our nice Earth. And this concept is rather old, so you can already find in the 17th century, you can find old world maps that have the latitudes and longitudes on them. And so it was already used uh, then by as a means of uh, specifying locations on our planet. And even the old Greeks, so if you go more than 2,000 uh, years back, even in this old world map by Eratosthenes, who knew only about the Mediterranean mainly, but also, well, he, he knew about Asia, but you can see even Africa, parts of it, at least North Africa, Europe. This is a very old map 2,000 years ago, and he already introduced and used a, um, a grid pattern to, to chop it up into pieces and to, to be able to specify points on the map with a pair of numbers. And now the person who really, really developed this uh, idea of coordinates, and to his honor we call them now Cartesian coordinates, is René Descartes. And his uh, Latin name was Cartesius, and that's why we call them Cartesian coordinates these days. So he lived in the 16th century, as you well know, and he wrote in 1637 a treatise, Discours de la méthode, pour bien conduire la raison, and so forth, so about um, scientific reasoning. And uh, this book had three appendices about uh, optics, about meteors, and about geometry. And uh, this third appendix, la géométrie, the geometry, that is where he explained his idea of coordinates. And it's rather simple. Of course, we all are familiar with this. So you lay out in your plane or in, in 
higher dimensions, you have more axes. You lay out two axes, usually orthogonal, an X and a Y axis. Where those cross, you say, is the coordinate uh, uh, or the point with coordinates zero, zero. And then if you have other coordinates, they tell you basically uh, where you are. So the point with coordinates two, two is here. The one with minus three, one is here. One minus two is here. And the way it works, of course, we all know this, the point two, two with X coordinate two and Y coordinate two simply means mathematically that we take the origin with coordinate zero, zero and add twice the a vector or well, a pair of numbers for the X coordinate which is just one zero and twice a pair of numbers for the y coordinate, which is zero one. So you could say one zero and zero one are some of the default vectors, the basis vectors in the coordinate directions. And mathematically, this coordinate two two simply means you algebraically add up zero zero with two times one zero and two times zero one. And in general, you know how that works for arbitrary x y coordinates. And this expresses all points in the plane in terms of x and y coordinates with respect to, we could say, with respect to three base points, the origin itself, then the unit vector to the right along the x-axis and the unit vector up along the y-axis. So this is how this works uh, mathematically and algebraically. And this was the first link, really, the first formal link between geometry and algebra. And only in this way we can now describe a circle algebraically as the solution of this equation. So the set of all x, y points in the plane that satisfy this, um, this uh, equation. While before Cartier, uh, Descartes, uh, the only way to, to describe a circle was in a geometric way to say, well, it's all the points that are, um, in this case, a distance two from the origin. And also, well, usual graphic, uh, well, the graph of a function, uh, we can understand that and plot that only once we have this link and we know about Cartesian coordinates. And that was really essential also for Newton and Leibniz to develop the theory of calculus. So it was really a major step forward in uh, mathematical uh, reasoning. Okay, coordinates, we all know this. Very essential coordinates, maybe not everyone knows that. So let me introduce those a little bit. They are much younger. They don't go back uh, for 400 years, but they go back only 200 years because that is when a German uh, mathematician and astronomer, August, August Ferdinand Möbius, who lived mainly in the 18th century, uh, 19th century, sorry, uh, he wrote another book, 1827, so almost 200 years after Descartes, and that was called the Barycentrische Kalkül, the Barycentric Calculus. And that is where he explained his idea of um, barycentric coordinates, which are a special case of homogeneous coordinates. And uh, in that time, in the early 1800s, there were several constructions actually of homogeneous coordinates, projective geometry evolved. And he had this particular idea of what we now call barycentric coordinates. Well, he called them barycentric coordinates and we we uh, copied his notation and his uh, um, nomenclature too. So we use that now. And it works like this. So we start with a triangle and we sign now triples of coordinates to all points in the plane and the corners of the triangle, they get very particular coordinates. So 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0 and 0, 0, 1, the unit coordinates. So, um, and then we do something very similar that we did before. We keep more, um, algebraically combining these coordinates. So for example, if we go halfway between the point with coordinates 1, 0, 0 and 0, 1, 0, then we land at the point with coordinates 1 half, 1 half, 0, because that's the algebraic um, average of these two coordinates, and that describes the edge midpoint of the edge with these two endpoints. And then if you average, say, this point here with this point here, then you get to the point with uh, which is halfway between this point and this point, and that then has the coordinates 1 quarter, 1 quarter, 1 half. This concept also works outside the triangle, uh, where then we start to have negative coordinates. But again, it's a way of describing all points in the plane with a triple of numbers. And while Cartesian coordinates expressed a point with x and y coordinates with respect to the origin and then two base vectors for the x and the y axis, here we describe every point with a triple of coordinates that are to be understood with respect to the base points, the corners of the triangle we started with, A, B, C, where A, B, and C have the, the unit coordinates, and every point, every other point in the plane, if it has coordinates A, B, C, 
you have to mathematically reason it like this. It is like taking a times little a times the coordinate of point A plus little b times the coordinate of point B and little c times the coordinate of point C. Very simple concept, uh, just like in Cartesian coordinates, but now we have three instead of two coordinates, so there must be some redundancy, and the redundancy is that these a, b, and c, the coefficients or the coordinates themselves, always add up to one. You can see it in all these examples, and that is a property that is kept. Of course, if you keep averaging uh, to, to um, coordinates, sets of coordinates that uh, add to one, and you average them with an affine combination, you get again coordinates that add up to one. And that's what it's all about. So these are barycentric coordinates, and they, in particular, can be used to describe all points in the triangle, but also outside the triangle. And the nice thing is that this is kind of um, independent of the particular shape of the triangle, in the sense that, for example, the barycenter, the center of the triangle, will always have coordinates one-third, 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 no matter which triangle you start with. And so these coordinates are invariant under affine transformations. And that is a nice, nice particularity of these coordinates. But they also actually go back to the old Greek about two, more than 2,000 years ago, uh, because they are kind of related to the law of the lever, which was, as we all know, discovered by Archimedes um, more than 2,000 years ago. And he found out that if you have two weights with masses W1 and W2, and they uh, are appended from, say, a bar that uh, sits here on a fulcrum, and uh, the distance is L1 or L2, respectively, then you have that the product of the distance of the first weight from the fulcrum times the mass is equal to the distance of the second weight um, from the fulcrum times its mass which we can use to lift a heavy weight here with a short distance to the fulcrum uh, by a very small force that is far away. If your bar is stable enough, you can potentially lift the world with your hands. Now, if we take this equation and express the distances that I called here L1 and L2, if we rather introduce here kind of a coordinate system, one-dimensional coordinate system, and say that fulcrum is at position V, and the weight is at position V1 and the other weight is at position V2, then these lengths, these distances L1 and L2, they just become V1 minus V and V2 minus V. And the law of the lever then reads like this. Now, if we further rearrange this equation, we can also express the position of the fulcrum um, in this way. Uh, so this is just rearranging this equation, solving for V. And we can see that this position V can be seen as an average of uh, the positions V1 and V2, where the two masses W1, W2 sit, um, linear combination, you weight them with the weight and you normalize by the sum of the weights. That is how you can express the position V in terms of V1 and V2 if you have a system that is stable in equilibrium. And this idea, this is the idea that uh, Möbius took further and on which he built his barycentric coordinates. And that's also the reason why they are called barycentric coordinates, because you can now understand um, W1 and W2 as the coordinates of the point V with respect to a weight at position V1 and a weight at position V2. So you, uh, and V is at the barycenter of this mass system, or body mass system. And this works not only in one dimensions, it works in general. So if you have a system of masses Wi at certain positions Vi, the barycenter of the system of masses is always described by a formula very similar to the one we just saw. So just to exemplify it, if we had, I mean, Möbius was an astronomer, so I chose planets to visualize this. So this is our first mass W1 at position V1. Here's another one here. Uh, okay, here's another one. And then the position of the system's barycenter is always given by this formula. You sum up the positions of your masses weighted by their mass and divided by the sum of the masses. So it's a normalized average of the positions of the masses where the normalizing weights are just the masses themselves. And that describes always the barycenter. And this is what he explained in the second chapter of his book, The Barycentric Calculus, second chapter. Down here, let me zoom into, he says 
that I translated for you because it's in German, that for the points A, B, C, D, with respected coefficients, little a, b, c, d, the center of gravity, the barycenter S, can be expressed as exactly what we just saw. So you average the positions of the masses, a, b, the capital letters, with the coefficients, the weights, and that gives you the barycenter times the sum of the weights. And now if you divide simply by the sum of the small letters, you have exactly the barycenter expressed exactly in the way that I have on the slide. So the barycenter of the system is the weighted set of the positions divided by the sum of the weights. And that, um, yeah, okay. And uh, this is nice because it expresses any point between V1 and V2 uh, in terms of these weights. Because if you now start changing the weights, the barycenter starts to shift. So if we make weight one heavier, of course, the barycenter will move towards the first mass. And if you make it smaller, it will move away because this one is then relatively larger. If you make it larger again, it will move there. And in this way, by just adapting the masses, W1 and W2, you can write any point between V1 and V2 as such a barycentric combination. And that is the key idea, um, the, yeah, basically the, the mental step that Mobius made instead of computing simply the barycenter of a system, he understood that you can also uh, see it the other way around and describe any point as a barycenter if you just choose the weights correctly. And that works not only in two um, coordinates uh, or in one dimension, it also works in two dimensions. So you can express any point inside a triangle, um, any point as a barycenter by just finding the right masses. And if you allow for negative weights, which is physically, of course, impossible, but mathematically, that's the advantage of mathematicians or physicists, we can do that. Then you can also express points outside the triangle, any point in the plane, in this case, as a, in terms of barycentric coordinates, as a barycenter of a weighted mass system. Uh, these masses are, of course, not unique because you can easily see if we multiply all the weights with a common scalar, then since we do it in the numerator and in the denominator, it cancels out if it's a common scalar eta. And so V is unchanged by that. And it's also clear that you can add more masses to the system and it will still work. There's still the possibility of finding masses W1, W2, W3 and W4 to express V as a very center. Um, but Möbius found out, of course, that you need at least d plus one points need uh, to span the whole of Rd. So if d is two, you need at least three points, the triangle in the plane, or in R3, you need the corners of a tetrahedron at least. But you can have more. So this is the idea of barycentric coordinates. And just to recall the theorems that Möbius was introducing in his uh, book, so he said that the, the barycentric coordinates W1 up to WD plus 1 for a point in RD. So in R2, it will be just three coordinates with respect to the positions where the masses are fixed. So in 2D, just the corners of the triangle. He showed that they are unique up to a common factor. So if you really make do with exactly D plus 1, the minimum you need, but not more than that, then the coordinates are unique up to a common factor, exactly as we saw on the previous slide. He proved that. So in D equals 2, it means uh, that for a triangle, these barycentric coordinates are unique up to a common scalar. And he also showed how to find these uh, barycentric coordinates. And it's actually quite simple. So we can express any point V inside the triangle as this barycentric combination, where the weights are always a common multiple of the area formed by the point V and the opposite edge. So the weight W1 is the area of this triangle formed by V and the edge between V2 and V3 opposite to V1. The weight W2 is the area of this triangle opposite to V2. So the edge opposite of V2 connected to V, that's a triangle and W3 is the area of this. And if you take these three areas, then any common multiple of these three areas gives you a set of barycentric coordinates for the point V. And uh, so that's what you showed, and I proved this to you. So this is uh, theorem number 23, Leersatz is theorem. So it is here on page 26 of his book. 
Uh, and he says, if we have really the, this barycentric combination, little a, the weight, times the position, and so forth, is equal to d, so for a triangle with corners a, b, c, then the point d, uh, this equation is true, if and only if a, b, c is not degenerate, and if uh, these weights, little a, little b, little c, in our case, those were the areas of these three triangles, are in the same ratios as the areas of these triangles. So you can allow for a common multiple, but uh, the key thing is really taking the areas of these triangles. So he proved this, and this extends nicely to high dimensions, where then in three dimensions you don't have areas of triangles, but volumes of tetrahedra formed by the points somewhere inside the tetrahedron and the opposite face, which is a triangle. And in high dimension, it works exactly the same way. Good. And then to get rid of this uh, common scalar and to really have unique barycentric coordinates, uh, you simply uh, talk about normalized barycentric coordinates. So you take these areas of the triangles and you divide by their sum. And this is how you get the normalized barycentric coordinates of the point V with respect to V1, V2, V3. So since this works for any position V inside and even outside the triangle, you can see these uh, coordinates as functions of the point V, and then you get these three barycentric coordinate functions, V1, V2, V3, which then have the properties, because of the normalization, they always add up to one. That's clear because if you take this VI for I1, 2, 3, you can see they all have the common denominator and the numerators are exactly W1, W2, W3, which add up to the denominator. So if you sum up the BIs, then they are one, so they are a partition of unity. They have the reproduction, reproduction property, or linear precision, you could say. That's exactly the barycentric property, which says if you take now these barycentric coordinates, you multiply them with the positions of the corners, and you sum it up, so you build this weighted average of the positions where the masses are with bi as the masses, you get back the barycenter. Um, here we don't have to divide by the sum of the bi's because that's one anyway, um, So, but you get back the barycenter, you get back the v that you started with. That's the main properties uh, of really that uh, classifies them as barycentric coordinates. In addition, we have that at least inside the triangle, these barycentric coordinates are positive because all these areas which you really have to compute as signed areas, they are positive inside the triangle for V inside the triangle. If V moves outside, then of course the sign may flip, or will flip actually, at least for one, up to two areas. Uh, so they are positive inside the triangle. And another very important thing, which is for all the applications that come out of barycentric coordinates, is that they have a Lagrange property. So if your point V moves or converges to one of the corners, say to V1, then the corresponding coordinate w1 will converge to 1, and all the other two coordinates converge to 0. You can see it easily because when v moves to here, then the green and the blue area will disappear, and the red area will be the area of the whole triangle. And this, of course, his denominator is always the area of the whole triangle. So yeah, then the division uh, gives you just 1. So they are 1 at the a corresponding corner, and there are zero at the two other corners. And that is the key property uh, why we can use them so nicely for interpolations. The basis functions, these barycentric coordinate functions, then look like this. They, For a triangle, they are simple linear functions because area is something linear in terms of v in terms of the position, divided here by that's a constant independent of v, it's just the area of the triangle. So it's a linear function which is one at the corresponding point, zero at the opposite edge, including the other vertices, and linear in between. So this is how these barycentric coordinate functions look, lo look like. And we have one for this vertex, we have one for this vertex, and we have one for this vertex. And now that we have these three normalized barycentric coordinate functions, B1, B2, B3, we can very nicely write down the linear interpolant of any data given at the corners of the triangle simply as this linear combination, we take the data fi, multiply it with a barycentric coordinate function corresponding to that, that vertex bi, sum them up, and that gives us the linear interpolant of the data that we started with. So here at v0 or v1, we have data f1, at v2, we have data f2, and at v3, we have here maybe a negative data f3, and the linear interpolating function can simply be expressed in this terms. 
So that is used uh, in particular, for example, by the graphics card that is making he heavy use of this and makes uh, our graphics cards, the GPUs, so fast these days. Okay, barycentric coordinates for triangles, and the similar thing goes in high dimensions for tetrahedra and high tetrahedra. Um, quick question, are you all with me, or do we have any questions by now? Sir, I hope there is no questions. Um, you can carry on. In the end, we will take the question answer session. Okay. So these were barycentric coordinates, probably familiar to, to many of you. They're also used um, to build shape functions in finite elements and so forth. So that's really a very well-studied problem and goes back to Möbius, as we saw. And our research now uh, was about generalizing this concept to build generalized barycentric coordinates. And the task now is like this. Instead of a triangle, we consider an arbitrary polygon in the plane or polyhedra in higher dimensions. Okay, so that one, now we, we have a polygon with corners, v, well, with vertices V1, V2, up to Vn. So not only up to V3, but up to Vn with n greater or equal to 3. And we would like to have some functions, W1, mass functions, that depend on the point V, such that the point V is again written as this barycentric combination, as the barycenter of the system of masses with masses W1, Wi, sitting at the vertices Vi of the polygon. So we would like to find functions Wi such that this equation is always uh, satisfied. Once we have these functions Wi, which you can understand as unnormalized barycentric coordinates, we can normalize them again, again in the same way as we did it before. So before these were just the areas of the triangles, of V and the edges of the polygon. Now we need something more clever. Uh, but once we have them, we normalize them exactly in the same way. We just divide them by their sum, only that now the sum may not be a constant, so it can also vary and depend on V. And then we get uh, normalized barycentric coordinates Vi, which automatically satisfy, again, the two first properties that we saw for barycentric coordinates. They form a partition of unity. That's exactly the same argument as before. The, we have a common denominator and the numerators add up to the denominator. And we have the reproduction property. So if we multiply the barycentric, the normalized barycentric coordinates with the positions of the vertices of the polygon, we get back the point V. Uh, that's the key properties for really calling them barycentric coordinates. And why do we have the last one? Well, it's because that's how we chose, that was the goal to find WIs that satisfy this property. And then it's easy to see that then we have the reproduction, the linear reproduction property. You can also combine these two and simply say they have linear precision, meaning that if we take any linear function, so degree uh, bivariate degree one polynomial, so simply a plus bx uh, plus cy, if we take such a polynomial phi and we evaluate it at the corners vi of the polygon and we multiply the results with the barycentric coordinate functions, sum them up, then we get back this linear function as a function of v. Linear precision. That's what we want to really have barycentric or generalized barycentric coordinates. And um, what about the other two properties? Well, the other two properties of barycentric coordinates for a triangle were positivity inside the shape and the Lagrange property. And we would also like to have those, in particular the Lagrange property, because then we can use them again for interpolation. We can simply build a linear combination of the data with these barycentric coordinate functions and get a usually then non-linear anymore, but we can get an interpolant of the data given at the vertices of the polygon. So and we could show in 2006, it's uh, so already 15 years ago, a long time, getting old. Um, so for convex polygons, we were able to show that if the WIs that satisfy the key barycentric property that we had on the previous slide, if we can find them such that they are positive inside the polygon, inside a convex polygon, then we automatically have that the, that the normalized barycentric coordinates are positive as well. That's clear because we just divide by the sum, so everything is positive, it stays positive. But more importantly, we always must get back or will get back the Lagrange property. And that is already much harder to show that this is a, um, a sufficient condition, the positivity of the weight functions or unnormalized coordinate functions, that that is sufficient to then get the 
normalized barycentric coordinates that have the Lagrange property. And in addition, that also pops out of the proof, we get linear behavior along the boundary. So these barycentric coordinate functions that we derive by normalization from unnormalized barycentric coordinate functions, if they are positive, they will always have a linear behavior. So the one for V1 will be one here, go linearly down to zero on that edge, stay zero on all these edges, and we'll get an increase linearly again from zero to one on this edge. And this behavior is really only uh, a sufficient condition for this behavior is that the weight functions must be positive. We still haven't talked about how to get these weight functions. I'll get there in a moment. But uh, of course, once we have this, then we are back in the situation that we had also for triangular barycentric coordinates. We can then use these normalized barycentric coordinate functions to very easily interpolate data given at the vertices by simply taking this linear combination. And again, so this is now the polygon, the convex polygon seen in 3D with data given visualized here at height. So we're looking at the graph. And then we get a interpolant of the data, which also in addition, because of this property of the last property, behaves linear along the edges of the polygon. And that's nice and easy because you can then simply evaluate this interpolant very efficiently, uh, directly and efficiently, instead of other methods for interpolating data in 2D, uh, for example, whatever radial basis functions or you name it. And we also know by the positivity that this is then because the PIs add to one, this is a convex combination, which tells us that the interpolant will always be inside the convex hull of the data. So it can't do anything crazy. So similar to basic curves, where you also have these properties that your curve will be in the convex hull of the control points. Here you will be guaranteed that your interpolant will be in the convex hull of the data. So it can't overshoot, it can't have weird wiggles, well, it could potentially still have weird wiggles, but it can't be that crazy. So that's already very nice. And uh, this is a very efficient way then of, uh, of building and also evaluating a interpolant as soon as you have a nice formula for the WIs and if they are positive. So how to get now WIs that are positive over at least say a convex polygon? Well, uh, we, as we summarize in our paper, in our 2006 paper, and as had been discovered before, so the first choice of WIs, functions that depend on the point V inside a convex polygon, the first such functions that satisfy the barycentric properties and from which you can build and normalize barycentric coordinates uh, with all the properties we had on the previous slide, uh, were due to Eugene Waxpress, who in the 70s studied this problem because he wanted to build finite element functions not for triangular meshes, but for arbitrary meshes with polygon, with polygonal cells, he figured out that if you take the cotangents of these two angles, you consider the triangles built by V, VI minus one VI, and V, VI, and VI plus one, you measure the two angles at VI in these triangles, you take the cotangents, add them up, and divide by the distance between V and VI, this RI, squared. That defines your function wi of v, and if you take that, you really get the barycentric properties that we had on the previous slide. He showed it back then um, by converting these cotangents into areas, basically. You can do this, uh, multiple uh, products of areas uh, and ratios of areas, you can do that. Uh, we could find out uh, a simple proof that this is always true. And then my co-author, Mike Floater, in the early 2000s, he discovered these mean value coordinates, which he found by uh, discretizing the mean value property of harmonic functions. Um, you have to read his paper to get the details. But he found that if instead of taking now the cotangents of these angles, you can also take the tangents of half these angles, the angles in these two triangles at V. You take half these angles, take the tangents, add them up, and divide only once by the distance between V and V1. V so only divided by ri, not by ri squared. If you do that, you also magically get barycentric coordinates, positive inside this uh, convex polygon. And the third choice that comes actually from discretizing harmonic functions in different way, and that is the standard thing uh, used in the classical finite elements for triangles, you take the cotangents, the sum of the cotangents of the angles opposite the edge from V1 to VI in these two triangles, and that sum, again, is a function of V. And if you take that, again, you have barycentric coordinates. Now, that was a nice observation. So we knew about these three choices. And we were able to put them 
in the common formula, which then sheds more light and more uh, knowledge about this. And the common formula is this. So the common form is simply you build your functions wi of v as a combination of these distances from v to vi, that's these ri's with the several indices, and areas, and also some power p. So just for the um, notation, so ai, that are the areas formed by v and an edge of the polygon. The area bi is the area of the triangle formed by v and vi minus 1, vi plus 1. So uh, that's an edge, uh, that's kind of a second, an ear of a polygon. So this is the area bi that pops up in this formula. And ri are just the distances from v to vi. And we figured out that this general formula captures all the three choices we knew of before for different values of this power p here that we take the distances from v to vi, uh, where, where we take the, uh, the power here. If we take p equal to zero, then this is just one, and this is one, and this is one, so it's just a rational function of areas, then we get box press coordinates. And it was known before that it is a rational function of v because um, the, the areas are all linear, so all together you then get a rational expression in v. If you choose p equals one, then you get mean value coordinates, and if you take p equals two, you get back the discrete harmonic coordinates that we saw on, on the previous slide. And of course, for any other choice of p, you get another set of barycentric coordinates that you can normalize and then have uh, barycentric coordinates for, at least in the first place, for convex polygons. Although you can also use this formula for non-convex polygons, but then certain properties cannot be guaranteed anymore. For that, you would uh, have to recall that these areas must always be taken as signed areas. So you always have to re, uh, check the, the, well, if you just compute them with a determinant, you get the signed area automatically, but it just means that if you cons if the triangle, uh, say, V, the I, V, I plus one, the triangle for the area A, I, if that is counterclockwise oriented, then the area A, I is positive, otherwise it's negative. So if V moves across this edge, then A, I becomes negative. So always signed areas here. Okay, now we, we now had a whole family of barycentric coordinates that we, that we could build for different choices of this power P with these special cases. And you can see already from the plots here that Vaxpress and mean value, well, they have this nice convex hull property. So the interpolant doesn't leave the convex hull of the data that we interpolate here. But for P equals two, we do leave it. So you can see that here the interpolant overshoots uh, the maximum of the data value. So it goes a bit outside the convex hull. And that is possible only, of course, if some of the normalized barycentric coordinates are negative. If they're all positive, since they add up to one, you are guaranteed to be in the convex hull. But for this choice P equals to two, you don't have that uh, guarantee anymore. So even in a convex polygon, the discrete harmonic coordinates can become negative, while Vaxpress and mean value are guaranteed to stay positive. That's also quite easy to prove. Okay, so that was one observation we had. And then, uh, so this basically covers already quite a bit for convex, for the case of convex polygons. And now let's have a quick look at what happens if we move from a convex polygon to a non-convex polygon, because then certain things start to happen. So I plot here one of these basis functions for Vaxpress, mean value and discrete harmonic coordinates. So for the three choices, P equals zero, one, and two in the formula before. And we study the function for this vertex of this quadrilateral. It's a convex quadrilateral. All these basis functions have in common that they are one at the corresponding, at the vertex that we're looking at. They go linearly down to zero, stay zero on the opposite edges, and then go linearly up to one again. So that is uh, what we know. If, they are, if the WIs are positive, then they must have this behavior. For, for these coordinates, we don't know, we can't be sure that they are always positive, but we uh, concave. So we push it, we push it. Now, now we have pushed it onto the line that connects its two neighbors. So now our quadrilateral has degenerated into a triangle and re we recover, of course, the triangular barycentric coordinates. That's not hard to see, that must happen. And now we push it a bit further. And now we make the quadrilateral really concave. And you see that while mean value coordinates still behave very nicely, for Vaxpress and discrete harmonic coordinates, we get poles in the interpolant. So here, the poles happen to lie on a straight line, actually, which is inside the shape, unfortunately. And here, it's a curved line, well, a curve, along which the poles happen that actually interpolates this vertex that we have pushed inside. 
How does that happen? Well, it happens because of the normalization. Recall that the we defined our B as our normalized barycentric coordinates as the ratio of the unnormalized WIs that we computed with a general formula that depended on the RIs and the AIs and the BIs before by their sum. So here I denote the sum with a cap letter capital W. Uh, so that is just the sum of all the unnormalized weight functions. And of course, if that sum is zero, then we divide here by zero. And unless we are in a lucky case where we have zero by zero and it converges, um, we get these poles because we divide by zero. And the function then, these BIs, uh, diverge to infinity. Okay, um, but you can see already here that for mean value coordinates, this doesn't happen. And actually mean value coordinates are so special that this doesn't even happen if we have more complicated uh, configurations. So for example, if we consider this set of polygons, so here with one component even inside a larger component, so these are two polygons, three four polygons, even for this configuration, you can define mean value coordinates and they will stay well-defined everywhere. So you will never divide in the normalization step by zero. And we could prove that. And uh, then the basis functions still look like this. So these are now three of these barycentric basis functions for the three points of the polygons that I um, emphasized here. So for this point, it's this function. You see it's one at the point itself, zero, at all other edges except the ones that are connected to this point where it goes linearly down to zero. Um, yes, so that is uh, here it goes linearly down to zero and here it goes linearly down to zero. And at all the other edges, including this one, even though you don't see it, it is zero. So it's exactly the behavior that was predicted. So it was predicted only for convex polygons, there we can prove it, but it happens also for non-convex polygons. And here are just two more examples. And you can use then again for interpolation, that is the key application. And for example, you can do color interpolation. You can take now these barycentric basis functions, multiply them with a certain color given at all the vertices of the polygons, add up the weighted colors, weighted by the barycentric coordinates for every point in the plane, and then you get the color interpolation like this. Uh, there's a small caveat because we can't guarantee the coordinates to be positive outside the polygons and even inside the polygons, some of them can be negative. So the, co the weighted combination of colors may leave the valid color range, so that's why you have to cut off. So it is uh, then, overall, this is not a smooth interpolation. It cuts off at the maximum at the white and it cuts off at, at black and all the other unit colors. So uh, we, yeah, that's where we are. the interpolate may become negative. We have to cut it off at zero, or where it becomes larger than 255, we have to cut it off there. But you don't really see these artifacts in the color interpolation. That's one application of mean value coordinates. Another application, vector field. So here we took a very densely sampled polygon, so it looks almost like a smooth curve, actually three of them. And the data we want to interpolate with mean value coordinates is vector data, unit vector data given at all the vertices of this dense polygon, here pointing inside the shape, here pointing outside the shape. And what you get is nicely interpolating vector fields that do interpolate the given data on this green shape and everywhere else it's a smooth um, interpolation. So the visualization here visualizes the um, flow in this vector field. So that is a, um, a line integral convolution plot. Uh, which you have understand, um, to understand like this. So basically this, these streak lines give you the orientation of the interpolated vectors and the colors give you the, link, uh, the length, which is white is length one, that is what is given on the shape, which happens on the shape, and red is then some positive uh, length and blue is some negative length or the other way around, I don't recall the details. So uh, I think, oh no, red is uh, towards zero length, right? Red is going towards zero length, so that what's happening, for example, here at almost the medial axis of the shape, uh, where then, of course, the contribution from the uh, vectors pointing here to the right and the vectors pointing to the left cancels out to give zero vectors. So red is zero length, white is length one, and blue is longer than one. So again, you know, very simple, you can interpolate data like this. And the data can not only be colors, can be vectors, can be points. You can also use it in graphics to do smooth shading. So for those of you who may know a little bit about computer graphics, 
which is my background also because of my PhD. I did it in the graphics lab in Erlangen. Uh, so this will be flat shading where you just compute one color per face of a triangular mesh uh, according to some lighting equations that uh, are derived from physics. Um, a slightly more clever idea is to compute colors at all the vertices of your mesh according to a normal given there. The normal for a face is, of course, just the normal of the face. But if you define a normal at each vertex, you can also do a lighting calculation, taking the lights into account and uh, the position and the normal of the surface at that point. You can compute a color per vertex and then do linear interpolation over each triangle. That's something that the graphics card can do on the fly. Uh, but then you get these artifacts here, so it's only C0 across the edges. doesn't look so good. Much better it is if you, instead of doing this, interpolating color computed at the corners, at the vertices, you interpolate the normals given at the vertices of each triangle. Then you interpolate the normals over the triangle so you have a specific normal of an underlying assumed smooth surface at each point. And that is what you then use to do a color computation per pixel. And then you get a much smoother shape. And now you can already see where the light sources are. So you have blue light source somewhere up here and a purple light source somewhere up here. So you can see this now and the yellow light source shining onto this point. And you can do even better because you still have artifacts here because it's, again, just a piecewise linear interpolation. And then in this flat pentagon that we have here, the flaps of this pyramid, uh, then you still have artifacts that you can see. And if instead you, you, you would use mean value coordinates to interpolate the five normals given here at the corners of this pentagon and treat it really as a non-convex pentagon instead of three triangles and do the interpolation with mean value coordinates, then you can get this perfect solution. And uh, that, this could potentially be implemented even in hardware. Uh, we at least were able to implement this in the shader, in the fragment shader of the GPU to produce these pictures. So that's quite nice. Um, and for quadrilaterals, you can do it even more generally. So what the graphics card is currently doing with quadrilateral elements is splitting it into two triangles, either along one diagonal or the other diagonal of the quad, uh, and producing, of course, such a piecewise linear shape. If you instead do it with mean value coordinates, you get something like in the last column, which is actually uh, very smooth. It, it looks as, as if you're looking at a smooth surface. And this smooth surface you're looking at looks almost like the smooth surface that you get by just building a um, um, harmonic interpolant to the boundary data. So if you just fill in the area with uh, the, the surface with least area to the boundary of this quadrilateral, then you get this harmonic shape. And if you visualize that, so here we did it by just patching it up into 20 by 20 pieces and visually, visualizing that as a piecewise linear function. Uh, then this looks very similar uh, to, sorry, very similar to what you get if you would interpolate with mean value coordinates. And one more example, transfinite interpolation. So here you can really no, my wife, I'm sorry, but I don't have the time to answer you. Uh, so uh, you have now really curves on the boundary and height data in this case given instead of polygonal data. And you can uh, define a transfinite version of mean value coordinates that you can then use to interpolate data, really continuous data given on a continuous shape, not a, or a smooth shape, not piecewise linear shape. And then you get interpolating surfaces like this uh, with very nice curvature plots. And if you compare it to the thin plate interpolant computed here with radio basis functions, the one that minimizes some bending energy, you can see it's a very similar and maybe even nicer because it is, doesn't have such a sharp bend, for example, in this region. And if you compare the curvature plots, you can also see its mean and Gaussian curvature. It is kind of similar, but this one is rather easy to uh, evaluate and to compute while for ready basis functions and to you first have to solve a big linear system uh, to get it. So it's more efficient to do this. Uh, this whole property or these whole properties have also been developed to build in CAGD multi-sided Bayesian patches, even over domains with whole worlds. This is built on mean value coordinates and Tamash Varadi from Budapest, he used it heavily to construct surface blends uh, to create nice uh, surfaces. So this is all work based on this idea of mean value coordinates. 
And you can also use it in graphics, say, for mesh animation. So how does that work? Well, uh, let me just show an interactive demo. So the setting here is that you have a polygon and you associate with each vertex of the polygon not only um, a color or a vector, but a whole mesh. All these meshes are compatible in the sense that they have the same topological structures, same number of triangles, same connectivity, but different geometry. And you can now use mean value coordinates to interpolate between these horses, uh, and that gives you a very nice interactive uh, tool. So here I have in the upper right, you can see I have a control polygon, and with each corner I have an associated shape of the horse. And now I have a point inside the polygon, and uh, with this, by dragging this around, I get different interpolations of the data of the horses associated with the vertices. The interpolation is here happening now with mean value coordinates. So we have the Lagrange property. If I move the point towards one of the vertices, I get back the position or the, sh the shape of the horse that is associated with the vertex, and everywhere else I get an interpolation. I can do linear interpolation between two poses, by going along the edge. I can also extrapolate, so I can exaggerate kind of a movement. And I can define basically the whole animation of the horse simply as a curve, as a curve in 2D in this thing. That's quite nice, and we use it to, to compress animation sequences quite heavily. And you can not only move the point in the center, you can also move the control points, that which also then uh, can be used to, to define more different kinds of interpolants. So again, the property is kept, but then you can extrapolate even more. Uh, now it starts to become a bit too exaggerated, but that's a very nice tool to, to work with. So for animators, this is potentially a very nice application. And another thing that can also be used for image warping, so there it works like this. So we take a picture, we define a control polygon that captures a shape that we want to modify in the given picture, and then we can just move the vertices of our control polygon to uh, get a deformed image, image warping. So here uh, I can show you how it works. So I take this uh, picture of the Tower of Pisa. I did my post up there, so that's when I took this picture. Now I create a polygon that encloses the leaning Tower of Pisa. And now I can move the vertices, and using mean value coordinates, I can then warp the image, and it follows naturally. And if I... Wow, well, it's a bit small here, but... Getting the point is, so I can do this. Uh, well, this starts to be a bit unnatural, but if the, if the modifications are not too, too uh, severe, and I load a predefined polygon, Pisa morph, then you can straighten the leaning tower of Pisa uh, just using mean value coordinates. And if I don't show the polygon anymore, you can see now this looks uh, really like a real photo, um, but with a non-leaning tower of Pisa. That's another maybe fun application, but still it is kind of useful in, in the graphics context. People also did this in 3D for mesh warping instead of image warping, so you can then enclose a given shape with a polyhedral mesh and use mean value coordinates to deform it. It has also been used actually in a movie in, uh, um, uh, what was the movie, Ratatouille from Pixar. They used these uh, ideas to modify, to, uh, modify some of their characters. Uh, we also did it uh, with quadrilateral mesh, uh, with quadrilateral control meshes, which has certain advantages. Ah, yeah, here it was. Here were the slides for animation for Ratatouille. So this mouse character was um, modified using barycentric coordinates. They didn't use mean value. They used harmonic barycentric coordinates in uh, in the movie and also in the in the accompanying paper. So um, we're almost getting ready to wrap up. So closed form coordinates are the ones where barycentric coordinates can be really expressed in terms of a simple formula. And we saw three examples, Waxpress, discrete harmonic, and mean value coordinates, which are actually special cases of a general formula that we could find. And while Waxpress and discrete harmonic coordinates, they work only for convex polygons as soon as the polygon becomes non Convex, uh, they, you get poles in the interior, so that's not what you want in applications. Mean value coordinates are valid even for non-convex polygons. Um, and uh, about positivity, well, Waxpress coordinates are guaranteed to be positive inside the convex polygon, likewise mean value coordinates. But if you go to concave polygons, mean value coordinates can become negative. Actually, outside the convex hull, by construction, they have to be negative. Um, and discrete harmonic coordinates have the disadvantage that they can be negative even inside a convex shape. 
So these are the, were the th first three coordinates discovered, and we brought them together in our 2006 paper. Um, then Lippmann et al., they developed a variant of mean value coordinates that forces them to be positive even inside concave shapes, but they have then the artifact of being only continuous C0 inside the polygon, while the original formulation is really smooth, so C infinity inside the polygon. So that's a drawback of these positive mean value coordinates. Uh, there was another construction by Elizabeth Malch et al. in 2005 for no, that works for non-convex polygons, but they can also be negative, like mean value coordinates, and it's uh, much more complicated than mean value coordinates, and they don't really have an apparent advantage over mean value coordinates, so um, it's a nice construction, but I don't see any... Uh, advantages over mean value coordinates. Uh, then Alexander Belyav in the SGP paper, he uh, described another way, Gordon Wixom coordinates, to generalization of work done by Gordon Wixom for uh, circles. He generalized that to arbitrary polygons, again, they can be negative. Um, they can be forced to be positive in a similar way that mean value coordinates can be forced to be positive. That was described by Manson and Schaefer, but again, you by this, by having only continuity. There are Poisson coordinates so that were developed a few years later. Again, they can be negative, but they work for arbitrary polygons. Uh, there are power coordinates, uh, again, 2016, but they work only nicely for convex polygons. And with my PhD student, you consider for each interior edge, you consider the quadrilateral that's formed by the two triangles on both sides of the edge. You build mean value coordinates for this quadrilateral. But of course, as you change the polygon, then this triangulation may flip and then you may have also a discontinuity if you see the coordinates as functions of it. So this is just an overview of a few concepts. There are a few other concepts around for barycentric coordinates, but all of these have in common that they are closed form coordinates, so you really have uh, simple formulas to compute them, which is kind of advantage uh, advantages for applications. There are also computation coordinates. You can also describe coordinates with an algorithm, with a, with a numerical procedure. And one is, of course, harmonic coordinates. That's the one that they use for Ratatouille, where you simply define the normalized barycentric coordinates as the solution. Mr. Carl? Yes? Sir, um, sir Saiba would like to join for a few minutes. Sorry for the interruption. Um, can Thank he join? Yes, yeah, sure. of course. Thank I you. can interrupt. No problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Should I stop sharing my screen? Uh, yeah, you can. So here is our, our worthy Vice Chancellor, um, Dr. Professor Bushra Mirza, with us. Honored to meet you. Good afternoon, Madam. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, Madam, uh, you are audible. Madam Professor Kai Horman from Switzerland is with us uh, today for his presentation on generalized barometric coordinates. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, um, I congratulate our mathematics department for organizing this webinar. Uh, I think probably, to my knowledge, it's the first international webinar being organized by mathematics department. And uh, uh, then, of course, I uh, thank our resource person who has joined up, us, and I'm sure his input uh, would be very valuable for our research students as well as young faculty members. Um, I... Uh, personally feel that uh, uh, this COVID world is kind of a cloud in sil uh, you know, uh, as, as they say, every cloud has a silver lining. So this uh, COVID has enabled us to be in touch with such experienced resource persons um, very conveniently um, because being a women university and being a female researcher myself, I have always felt that one of the biggest limitation for our uh, female scientists is the um, networking. You know, they, they usually are not very, uh, it's not very convenient for them to travel and meet uh, experienced collaborators and uh, uh, develop, you know, collaboration uh, with them to uh, excel in their fields. And But nowadays, through these, uh, these webinars and e-conferences, now we have got the opportunity to uh, meet such experienced people and develop future collaborations. So um, that's wonderful. And I'm so glad and very thankful to the uh, professor uh, who has joined us for this uh, seminar. I'm sure 
this uh, seminar would not be just one time interaction with him. Um, our research students and uh, faculty members will be able to uh, develop you know, uh, long-term uh, contact with him so that in future also they um, can contact him for any, any future joint uh, research ventures. Um, I, I, all I can say is I, I wish you all the best for, and, and highly appreciate this effort and thank our uh, resource person to join us and uh, wish you all the best. A very productive uh, today's event as well as uh, future ventures. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Madam, uh, we now continue with Professor Kai Horman presentation. Yeah, after these very wise words, I'll try to add a few more from my side. Um, but yes, I, I totally agree. COVID has given us a chance that we didn't have before and uh, you're using it really well. And uh, I congratulate you to this and the math department that you organize this webinar. It's great. And it's a, also a great opportunity for me to reach you, right? So it's, it's really vice versa. Uh, it's a win-win situation for sure. Okay, computation coordinates. So we had this bunch of uh, coordinates with an explicit formula on the previous slide, but it's also possible to define normalized barycentric coordinates in different ways. For example, as the solution of Laplace's equation. It's not hard to see that if you specify the piecewise linear boundary behavior um, that we have for the other coordinates, and you take this as your boundary condition, and then solve for Laplace's equation in the interior, you surely get uh, barycentric coordinates because linear functions are in the kernel, they solve the Laplace equation, so you then get this linear precision by construction. And But the problem is, these solutions, these harmonic coordinates, we don't have a simple formula for them. You can only compute them, um, for example, using finite element methods or whatever, boundary element methods. Uh, so you have to compute them, and that's why I call them computational coordinates. Another possibility are what we call maximum entropy coordinates, which we described in an SGP paper in 2008, uh, where the idea is to maximize the so-called shannon Jane's entropy, something coming out of statistics, respect, again, with respect to the boundary conditions that we want, so linear precision, so partition of unity and uh, linear precision. And if you then uh, maximize this expression in terms of the BIs using certain prior functions, MI, that we, where we show how you have to create them, so that it all works out nicely, then you can also build coordinates that are positive inside arbitrary polygons and have all the properties that you would like to have. And another possibility are local barycentric coordinates where again, you solve a uh, constrained optimization problem. And what you optimize here is you minimize the sum of total variations. So you take the gradients of these BIs, integrate or the length of the gradients, integrate it over your domain, over your polygon, sum it up for all coordinates. And uh, the, your variables are the functions themselves. And with respect to the boundary constraints of being positive, being linear on the boundary, and having the barycentric property. You put basically all the properties that you want, you put them into your constraints, and then you minimize the sum of total variation, and you get uh, what you want. Uh, it's, you could say it's a bit cheating. It's not that natural, because you put basically everything, the, the, the magical properties, you put them simply as constraints, while for the... Um, say mean value coordinates, you just get them for free from a very, very simple formula. So that's, I think this is a bit more elegant, but still this is also a valid way of defining uh, local barycentric coordinates. They're local meaning in the sense that uh, they go very quickly down to zero. Uh, that's what happens when you minimize the sum of total variation. And therefore each basis function affects the interpolant uh, only in the vicinity of the corresponding vertex of the polygon, which has certain advantages in uh, in applications. Okay, so these are computation coordinates. Now let's uh, go a very have a quick look at the comparison. So here I took a non-convex polygon, and we can see here is one of the mean value barycentric coordinate functions, which is one here as we want, goes linearly down to zero, and but it happens to be negative, visualized here by this gray color and going down to purple. This is the region where this coordinate function becomes negative, which is which can be bad in some applications. So some in, in many applications you would like them to be positive, but sometimes you don't care. But it, it can be um, a disadvantage in some applications. 
The zero contour is the line here marked with orange. So it's zero on these edges and also zero here, of course, where it changes from positive to negative. And the green line is, I think, the 10 to the minus three contour line. So just a little bit positive to uh, show something for the local barycentric coordinates in a moment. Uh, these are blended coordinates that I mentioned before, where you can see they're now positive and they're actually zero everywhere here, which is kind of nice, makes them local in some sense as well. So they behave quite nicely. Harmonic coordinates are also positive by construction. But again, only computational, just like uh, well, mean value and blended are basically simple formulas that you can evaluate. Uh, and the support, so the region where, where the numerical support, which is the region where the function is um, not even close to zero, so larger than some small threshold, is actually quite large for harmonic coordinates. Um, maximum entropy coordinates, uh, the construction I mentioned before is yeah, also positive inside. Weird shape behavior here, so this is probably not so good for applications. And local barycentric coordinates have a nice shape uh, and are very local, so they are really numerically zero outside this or beyond this green line, so in the major part of the polygon, which makes them very local. So in, in this region, this function doesn't really have an influence because uh, the value is less than 10 to the minus 3, but they are the hardest to compute. And for a more complicated polygon, uh, they look like this. You can just see. So mean value coordinates can also be positive. One of these coordinate functions may be positive everywhere, but then another one will be negative and can actually be quite negative. In some parts of the polygon, um, the blended coordinates are always positive. Harmonics are also positive. Well, all the others are positive by construction. Maximum entropy coordinates can have weird artifacts. So here we have, again, a local maximum, which is probably undesired. Uh, you would really like to have the functions going yeah, going down to zero in a kind of smooth way and not have not, not exhibit local maxima like here. So I don't recommend max entropy coordinates, although we invented them for, for most of the applications. Uh, and local coordinates, uh, they're just too heavy to compute and the computation is not very stable. I mean, there has been progress on that end, uh, but still uh, they're too complicated, I would say. So the, the best, I would say, are still harmonic coordinates, but um, we, we only can compute them computationally, so that is a bit of a disadvantage. If you really want to know more about all this, and if you got interested, then I can refer to this book that I edited with my uh, co-author, um, Natarayan Sukuma from UC Davis, uh, where we put together uh, in three parts of the book the theory of generalized barycentric coordinates, the applications in graphics, and the applications in computation mechanics. And we have, if I recall correctly, 15 chapters in this book uh, with really prominent authors from the respective fields, and uh, which is a good resource if you want to get started in this topic. I'm sure you can uh, find this book, maybe even online. Otherwise, uh, you can buy it from uh, CRC Press. Maybe your university library can buy a few copies. Good. That brings me already to the end of the, well, already <laughs> we have been talking now for a bit more than an hour uh, to the end of the presentation. And just to wrap up, uh, uh, my recommendation for how to use these coordinates in, in applications. So if you have a convex polygon, I really, really uh, and the exterior angles are not too small, so you don't have flat uh, vertices where you have almost parallel lines, um, then I really recommend using Vaxpress coordinates. They usually behave very well inside convex polygons with not too small literary angles, so all angles are really nice, then backspread coordinates are the choice. If you have arbitrary polygons, uh, I still prefer mean value coordinates, which have the advantage of being well-defined actually everywhere in R2, in the whole plane, not only inside the polygon, no poles guaranteed. They are smooth, except at the vertices of the polygon where they are only C0, but everywhere else in the plane, they are smooth. And we could even show in a paper that the derivatives when you converge towards the vertices, even though the functions are not, the functions, these coordinate functions are not C1, the derivatives are bounded, so they are quite well behaved. The only negative thing for some applications, they can be negative, even inside the shape, inside the polygon. Um, if you really have to use positivity inside an arbitrary polygon, then you have to use harmonic coordinates, I would say, but then you don't have a closed form, so it's much harder to compute them um, but they really give you then what you want. 
But what we still, what the whole community is still searching for are the holy grail coordinates. We really would like to have coordinates that work for arbitrary polygons, at least inside an arbitrary polygon, have a closed form or a very simple um, numerical algorithm to compute them, and with a shape similar to harmonic coordinates, I would say. That is basically the best shape you can hope for. And if you happen to find those, then you really found the holy grail in, in this research area, and that will be worth a very, very important publication. If you can't find them, you can still maybe find other coordinates that have nice properties and beat the prime candidates uh, in some aspect. Maybe yeah, they are faster to compute, they have a better shape or whatnot. Uh, but uh, this is really the holy grail, the goal that we're all looking for. Simple formula coordinates um, in closed form, hopefully, or a very simple algorithm. Similar to harmonic coordinates, positive inside arbitrary polygons, and no poles, and we still haven't found them. So the search continues. And with this mission, uh, that is for all of you, I conclude my presentation on generalized percentage coordinates, and I thank you for your attention, and I'm very happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kai. Uh, it was expl explicitly explained and uh, having a lot of content in it. Definitely, it will be beneficial for the mathematics department. And I would like to uh, request the participants and, and the persons here if they have any questions regarding your presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Kai, for uh, such a thought-provoking uh, presentation. And I must say that you have broadened our horizon from just like uh, uh, Bayesian, Bernstein Bayesian curves or B sublime curves and all these activities. And uh, our MS and PhD students are also with us. So I would like to uh, you to kind, uh, kindly tell uh, us that uh, why we need to uh, normalize the uh, barycentric coordinate. Um, to, is there any geometric significance? In order to get the Lagrange property. Um, so if you, for example, have these unnormalized coordinates, you're not guaranteed to have them such that they are one at a vertex and zero at another vertex. So if you then build a combination of data given at the vertices of the polygon with unnormalized coordinates, you don't get an interpolating function. So that's why we prefer to normalize them so that they add up to one at least, so that we have, uh, if they happen to be positive, we have a convex combination. Otherwise, we really always at each point, we have an affine combination of points that makes, uh, that gives a good interpolant. That's basically what to do. Otherwise, you have no control. The interpolant with unnormalized coordinates can go anywhere. And that's not of no use then. Okay. And uh, the second question is that uh, if we are dealing with non-convex uh, data, uh, then uh, uh, but, um, uh, we also require the, the barycent positive barycentric coordinate or we can uh, liberate the condition of positivity. It would be great to have coordinates that are all positive inside any arbitrary polygon and harmonic coordinates have this property while mean value coordinates don't have it. Mean value coordinates are guaranteed to be positive only inside the kernel of a polygon which for convex polygons is the whole polygon, of course, and for arbitrary polygons, it may even be empty. Um, still, they tend to be positive almost everywhere or most of them, but they can be negative, as we saw in the examples for non-convex shapes, which then means that in these areas, you have only an affine combination, not a convex combination, so the interpolated value may be outside the convex hull of the data, um, so which can have problems actually in image deformation, which is one of the prime applications in graphics, it is not really a problem. You can still do nice uh, image warping, as you saw also in this, uh, when we moved, morphed that warped the Tower of Pisa. It depends on the application, whether that's a problem or not. Um, for example, if you use these as building blocks for a finite element method, negativity can be a problem because then you may not uh, have um, uh, preservation of mass, if I remember correctly. So you may lose that, and that is a quite important property, which you may lose, and then your numerical method may not converge as intended. So there you should really be, be careful. And so the interpolated, uh, interpolated point may go, go outside the convex hull. In outside case of the, 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 convex, uh, outside the, the convex hull of your polygon, you must be 
negative because uh, with convex combinations of the vertices of a polygon, you can get only into the convex hull of the vertices. So there's no way around that. Even for a triangle, the barycentric coordinates, the standard barycentric coordinates uh, must be, or they are negative outside the triangle and only positive inside. But that's ex at least what you would like to have generalized. You would like to have positive coordinates at least inside the polygon. And right now, well, harmonic coordinates do it, blended coordinates do it, maximum entropy coordinates, do it, local barycentric coordinates do it, but they're all kind of heavy to, to implement and to evaluate. It can be done, of course, no problem, people have done it, but it would really be nice to have simpler formulas with that property. And we're still looking for those. And uh, my third question is that I have read, uh, read in some books that barycentric coordinate must be infinite coordinates. Um, is it true? depends on your application. I would say C2 is, for all practical purposes, probably enough. Because you may want the derivative, you may want the second derivative to be continuous, or even you want to uh, get the first and second derivative of the interpolant anywhere. Um, but beyond that, I mean, there might be applications where you need that. Um, but probably for most applications, C2 is certainly enough. Even C1 might be enough. But for example, if you compute harmonic coordinates, which are perfect, but the way you compute them normally is you mesh up your domain, your polygon with a dense mesh, triangle mesh, and then you solve a finite element problem and you get only a piecewise linear function. So you have a hard time getting the derivatives of that function because that's always piecewise constant only. Uh, so that is that can be a disadvantage for certain applications. But C2, I guess, is, is enough. And I have received questions from one of my uh, colleagues that uh, if we restrict results only for regular polygon, what will uh, happen about the surfaces? Regular polygons, good question. I, if I remember correctly, there was a very old construction going back to, um, what's his name, uh, Charles Loop, the one who invented loop, co loop subdivision coordinates. Charles Loop, he had a paper back in the late 80s or early 90s uh, where they defined or where they considered Bayesian constructions over regular polygons. And there they basically developed barycentric coordinates for regular polygons already back then. Um, but I don't remember the details of that construction. But that works really only for regular polygons. And I think it is... It's related to just uh, taking a rational combination of areas, just like you do for triangles. But that works only for regular polygons, if I remember correctly. I, I missed the details, but uh, if you go to the book, uh, you will find it. And even on my web page, I have a link there to a page uh, where we have all kinds of references to papers on barycentric coordinates. Um, uh, you can you can probably find that that uh, paper there. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will try uh, myself also for this. And thank you uh, very much for your such a nice explanation. Now, Dr. Sahar, over to you for any other questions. We have other questions, Sarah. maybe from the students. I hope yes. Ms. Uh, yes. Selma would like to ask any question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Ms. Alma, uh, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Yes, uh, I, I just want to, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Kai that it was really a great deal of information for us. I mean, for a person like me who is not uh, very much uh, uh, working in CAGD, I was familiar with these types of applications that this is somehow uh, being applied in animations. But uh, today, the way he explained that how uh, how we can use mathematics in like in animation for example uh, in the uh, movements of horse that when the point uh, is inside the convex hull there will be uh, movements in the horse that